Tapes of all time. Six weeks ago, the BBC's Big Read began the search for the nation's best love novel, and we asked you, the public, to nominate your favourite books. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. A Prayer for Owen Meany. The Colour of Magic by Terry Pratchett. Oh, cool. There isn't one favourite book. Catcher in the Rye. 1984 by George Orwell. Oh, sorry, I thought we were on radio. Hiya. Your votes came flooding in. Nearly 7,000 different books were nominated in all. Some got just one vote, others got thousands. I would like to see Wuthering Heights, my favourite book by a woman. All of Jane Austen. Of course, Gone with the Wind. I'd expect some Thomas Hardy. Rouge et Noir. I would certainly want both War and Peace and Anna Karenina. No. To Kill a Mockingbird. Add some Wonderland, Win in the Willows. I mean, so many, it's just ridiculous. In the autumn, we're there in the top 20 and asking you to vote again for your favourite read of all. But to give you an idea of what's in the running, here's your top 100. Well, what a terrific list. Harry Potter, Harry Potter, Harry Potter, Harry Potter. Lovely, I'm on it. I want to read them all now. Who ever said democracy was a good thing? I like this list. It's a very mixed bag. Tonight, we'll be answering some of the big questions about the books you love. Do you still treasure the old classics? Does a book have to become a movie to be remembered? And which authors had the most books nominated? Stand by for some surprises. Is bigger better? Does quantity mean quality? Some of you think it does because you voted quite a few doorsteps into your top 100. So which is the longest book that you've nominated? Gone with the Wind? Could be Middlemarch, that would be lovely. Moby Dick, that's quite long. Lord of the Rings. War and Peace was huge. Of the longest reads that made it into your top 100, the fifth longest is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. 1,095 pages and 117 chapters of swashbuckling adventure. The Count of Monte Cristo is, to me, one of the world's great books, and I'm very glad it's there. Take your hands off her! Don't touch her! It's a story about a, a young man who is unjustly imprisoned in the Chateau d'If from which he escapes in an extraordinarily exciting way. And he has enormous wealth because in prison an old abbe gave him the secret of an island full of treasure. It's a compulsively readable book, but it's also a beautiful book. It was a revelation to me. The fourth longest is Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, 1,112 pages of wizardry. The third longest is Tolstoy's epic War and Peace, weighing in at a massive 1,306 pages. Nelson Mandela read it to pass some of his 30 years in prison. The second longest is The Stand by Stephen King, spanning 1,421 pages. It was originally published a quarter shorter, but the uncut version has since been released. And the longest book to make it into your top 100, at a whopping 1,474 pages, is A Suitable Boy, Vikram Seth's best-selling family saga, set in the post-colonial India of the 1950s. <laughs> It's the longest single-volume novel ever published in English, and it took eight years to write. I didn't know it was going to be so long. What has amazed me, uh, the fact that anyone really has found the time to read it in... <laughs> <laughs> it's spectacular, of course, from the first, the first sentence is something like, um, oh, it's about Mrs. Rupa Mira, this charming uh, matriarch, trying desperately to, to marry off her blasted daughters and find them suitable boys each.
and suddenly you realise you're from line one, you're back with Mrs. Bennet and her daughters in Pride and Prejudice. It's a wonderful kind of modern return to the classics of the, uh, the turn of the 19th century. And if you were wondering what is the shortest book on the list, it's The Twits by Roald Dahl at a titchy 87 pages. If you've got a book you can't put down and want to talk about it, why not join a reading group? Have you met Miss Jones? Hannah Rutland and her girlfriends discuss their books in a bar in South London. We all go out anyway, we talk about books anyway, so it's really an excuse to go out and have a laugh. The great thing about it is you find out what other people think. The older you get, it's hard to find a reason to meet up with all your female friends. And the book group kind of gave us an excuse to get together on a regular basis. It's quite nice to sort of throw in a book that maybe um, people don't, wouldn't have read necessarily and they have to sort of read it for the book group. It kind of opens your mind a bit. Some of the books I've just looked at the cover and thought, I'm going to hate that, I've ended up absolutely loving. If someone came up to me with a chat up line, have I read any good books recently? Um, I think they're a very interesting person. It's so much better than, um, can I buy you a drink or do you come here often? If you want to find out how to join a reading group or set one up, call The Big Read on free phone 08000 150 950 or visit our website at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash big read. If you register your reading group with us, you could win some great prizes, including all the top 100 books. Under For some writers, their first novel is also their last, Under and early success can lead to writer's block. Others have been cut down in their prime. So how many authors in your top 100 were one-hit wonders? I can't think of any. Tiny percentage, I would say. I would have thought four or five. 100 books, two. Maybe 33%. They are. And the answer is six of your top 100 were one-hit wonders. If you've written a stunning first novel, it must be fiendishly difficult to write a second. Emily Bronte published her only novel, Wuthering Heights, in 1847. It was a huge hit, but she never got the chance to complete another manuscript. The tragedy which underlies the whole Bronte story, Charlotte, as well as Emily, and their sister Anne, is that they were all wiped out by tuberculosis. And I think one of the things that's true of the 19th century, previous, previous centuries to ours, is that death has been a great critic. Another one-hit wonder was Anna Sewell with Black Beauty. She didn't start writing it until she was 50 and died a few months after it was published. Robert Tressel was driven to write The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist after seeing the desperate poverty endured by workers living on the south coast of England. The author is furious about this, and that's what fuels the book. He wasn't furious about anything else, and so he didn't write another great book. Gone with the Wind sold one million copies in the first six months of publication, but Margaret Mitchell never wrote another novel. Margaret Mitchell wrote a huge bestseller, made, made, which was made into a huge film, and I think it was probably oppressed by this success. Harper Lee was only 34 when To Kill a Mockingbird was published. She's now 77, but has never written again. You've also nominated The God of Small Things, which won Arundhati Roy the Booker Prize in 1997. Despite earning over $2 million in royalties, she turned her back on fiction to fight for humanitarian and environmental issues in northern India. She's written a lot um, of other kinds of things since uh, writing that book and winning the Booker Prize with it. So I don't think we can think of her as a writer who's sort of seized up or dried up. In fact, she's just a writer who's redirected her energies. Most authors in your Top 100 parade have only had one of their books chosen but others have displayed their talents again and again. So which author do you think has had the most titles nominated? Well, Dickens will get multiple nominations. Barbara Carland. If you could put the Brontes as a kind of, <laughs> you know, as a kind of one-man ace club seven. Cookson. Got to be Catherine Cookson. When it comes to your favourites, there are three authors who've each had four books nominated. One of them is Roald Dahl, a writer who's thrilled generations of children and adults. You've chosen the BFG, Matilda, the Twits, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. 
he knows how to invent new situations, which of course is wonderful if you're illustrating the books because there's always something to draw. It's a very visual imagination. They're exciting, they're exaggerated, there's a strong element of caricature in them. And as he used to say, you can deal with quite difficult things as long as you deal with them with an aspect of humour. You cannot write about something grisly unless it's funny. But if you can make it grisly and funny, then, then they love it, you see. So do I, that's why I do it. I read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory really young and wanted the gold ticket like all kids do and I wanted to be in there with all those swirling um, candy flosses and the river of chocolate. Willy Wonka is a brilliantly nasty, teasing character. So troublesome as well as being this benefactor. Roald Dahl understood that children are fundamentally nasty, horrible, despicable, selfish creations. And that is the truth at the heart of all his books, and people recognize it. Next is J.K. Rowling. All four of her Harry Potter books have made it into your top 100. No surprises there. Since the first was published in 1997, she's sold 20 million copies, and they've been translated into 55 languages. They're really good books, and what she's done for literature is incredible. She's got children, especially boys, reading again when people are worrying they've been lost to the computer console generation. It's the detail, and the devil, and as always, the angels are in the details, are in the, 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 the created world. The, you, you feel it, you smell it, you touch it, everything from the, the kind of sweets they eat to the, to the, the colour of the robes they wear and to the, the laws of, uh, of Quidditch and to all those sort of details are so beautifully done. And the second appeal is straightforward. It's the appeal of boarding school. Um, it's a world where the adults are marginal and in the background and the children run things um, their own way. I remember when the fourth book had just come out and it was like the new fashion accessory, all these kids standing around holding these books which were like big bricks of books, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful sight and it's an image that's always stuck with me. And Jacqueline Wilson, one of Britain's most prolific children's writers, also has four books on the list. Double Act, Girls in Love, The Story of Tracy Beaker, and Vicky Angel. My goodness me, how, how very charmed and flattered and thrilled I am. I'm really delighted that Jacqueline Wilson features so strongly on the list, because I think she's a serious and important writer. Um, I think that she has utter respect for children. And in each of her stories, she shows that respect by not flinching at difficult, difficult subjects, from eating disorders to bereavement to divorce, everything. But she also creates funny and memorable characters with it. So her books are incredibly vivid, uh, very moving and very powerful. Tracy Beaker is about a child who is completely outrageous, but she does have an excuse for her bad behavior. She's being dumped in a children's home. She doesn't like this situation, and she's going to fight back and make life difficult for everybody. This is my room. Whoever's in it can pack up that scratchy stuff and clear off right now. But though she is a very tough customer, deep Deep down inside, she's a bit of a softy too. Are you crying? Bug off, please. Tracy B can never cry. Jacqueline Wilson's not afraid to tell these stories, and children have not been afraid to read them. But the joint winners in this most nominated category both have five books in your top 100. They're as popular as each other, even though they're separated by 150 years. One is Charles Dickens, who published 16 novels in his lifetime, and you voted for five of them. They are A Christmas Carol, A Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, Bleak House, and David Copperfield. Ah! Ah! Well, it's a book very close to my heart. It's a story of one human being and their struggle with life. He has a simply terrible time, right down being put into a blacking factory. Mickey here will show you the ropes.
And then he sort of runs away and he finds his aunt Betsy Trotwood. If you please, aunt, I am your nephew, David Copperfield. Oh. I was brought up in a house with no books at all. And later in life I discovered I was very ill-read. And I made a rule about five or, no, about ten years ago that when I went on the train I'd read a classic I hadn't read. And I read David Copperfield on the train coming to London. I never read it without the tears coming to my eyes. Sharing the first prize as the author with the most books nominated is the creator of Discworld, Terry Pratchett. Yes, it's you. <laughs> Dengue. Pratchett? Terry Pratchett. Who is Pratchett? It could just be that I'm quite popular. The winner takes it all. You voted for Mort, The Colour of Magic, Good Omens, Guards, Guards and Nightwatch. Really good to see Terry Pratchett on there, a wonderful, wonderful fantasy writer. For me, Colour of Magic is the one I really like. Perhaps it was the first one I read, so that's why I feel so special about it. But he's created this wonderful world of Discworld. He's then inhabited it with this menagerie of creatures, people like Rincewind the Wizard, you know, not even a very good wizard. And his great strength is actually putting these characters in that we can all relate to because they're all in it for their own self-interest. The way he describes something, it's so outlandish and so original, but it creates this wonderful picture in your head. You've now heard about 33 of your top 100 books. Still to come, your favourite modern bestsellers. These three were all huge blockbusters, but only one of them has made it into your top 100. Which do you think it was? A bar in East London is encouraging spy book enthusiasts to come in from the cold and talk about their love of espionage and literature. So they start off as a bit of a joke, people who pick it up and sort of nudge and say, uh, page 77, line two. I hear there's snow on the roofs in Moscow. Yeah. So it became a bit tongue in cheek. And then people who generally enjoyed reading sort of books in general, particularly spy books, would come down and sort of like, exchange unusual rare ones. Spy books really, I got into through growing up in Cold War Britain in the 1970s. It was like the towers of a far and distant land that weren't really that far and distant. And although they were glamorous, there was a bit of a cold edge to them as well. So it was reality, but with, you know, there was always good looking girls involved. Would I like to be James Bond? Who wouldn't? If you want to find out how to join a reading group or set one up, Call The Big Read on free phone 08000 150 or visit our website at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash big read. And if your group wants to go reading mad, then why not take up the Big Read challenge to read all 100 books? The American author Mark Twain famously defined a classic as a book which people praise but don't read. Is this true for you? Which is the oldest book in your top 100? People argue a great deal about what is the first novel. I think that the, the best answer is Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, first published in 1719. Ahoy! And appropriately, it's all about a man making the world anew out of just the raw materials around him. I think it's also, therefore, the, the root of every adventure story since. It's a story of self-sufficiency. If you were to take a vote amongst 18th century readers, I think the winner would be Samuel Richardson's Clarissa. Another possible earliest novel would be Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, published between 1759 and 1767. But you didn't choose any of these. In fact, not a single novel in your top 100 is from the 18th century. I think that is absolutely incredibly depressing. Oh, sad, actually, because I think it is probably to do with TV. The third oldest book is Persuasion by Jane Austen, published in 1818, a year after her death. The second oldest is also by Jane Austen, and it's Emma, published in 1816. I wish you would not make matches, my dear. Do not make any more of them, Emma. Oh, I smiled when I saw Emma was there. I just love Emma herself. 
her stupidity and uh, the brilliant way Jane Austen makes you love Emma even though she behaves badly. She takes up with a young girl called Harriet Smith who lives nearby and Harriet likes a young man of the village who Emma feels is socially inferior. There is Mr. Martin. Oh, really? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, please say what you think of him. He is very plain, undoubtedly. But there is nothing compared with his entire lack of gentility. It's an outrageous thing to do to dissuade Harriet from pursuing this love of her life. It was badly done, and I'm sorry for it. It's a wonderful picture of human behavior. Wonderful. And the oldest of all, you've guessed it, it's her again. Jane Austen scores a hat trick with Pride and Prejudice, published way back in 1813. What is it about her that still appeals to readers 200 years on? The secret is her patient understanding of human nature. That's number one. I, I think Jane Austen's sort of take on the world is very modern. The way she stands back and analyzes people, that's very much the way gossip columns are now. It's extraordinary. And are you sure it's true? Charlotte, how could it be otherwise? Every circumstance confirms it. And Mr. Darcy has boasted to me himself of his resentful, implacable. The other is her wry attitude to social and personal mores and manners. And it's a picture of the manners of the society, too. And in case we're wondering what the most recently published book is in your top 100, it's Terry Pratchett's Night Watch, published only last November. Young at heart, 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 heart. But which authors were the youngest when the novels you chose were published? J.K. Rowling, is she quite young? Helen Fielding. Zadie Smith for White Teeth. One of the Brontes, they were quite young. There are five authors, 30 or under, who have been voted by you into the top 100. Stella Gibbons was 30 when her comic masterpiece, Cold Comfort Farm, was published. Hugely popular when it came out in 1932, it satirized the prevailing view of English country life as a rural paradise. I thought it was a serious thing about town girl goes to live in the country. And then once I'd kind of kicked into it, um, oh, I just laughed and laughed and laughed. I just think it's brilliant. Oh, something in the woodshed. I saw something nasty in the woodshed. The main character comes into this kind of terribly dreary world and, and she just sorts everyone out. Haven't you heard of family planning? No one. You can prevent it. All you need is a little rubber bowler hat to stop it happening again. And you keep waiting for something bad to happen or for her to get her comeuppance or, or you know, a, a terrible twist that will turn into tragedy. And it doesn't. You know, this sunny, silly daft girl comes in, sorts everyone out, makes everyone happy and then flies off on a plane. What more can you ask for in a book? Oh, Charles, you do have heavenly teeth. Come on. Emily Bronte was just 29 when she published her gothic masterpiece, Wuthering Heights, using the pseudonym Ellis Bell. Donna Tartt was only 28 when her bestseller, The Secret History, was published in 1992. But it took her 10 years to write her next book. Also 28 was F. Scott Fitzgerald, when he published The Great Gatsby. I have always loved reading since I was a little kid. And to pick up a book that takes you into another world and evokes these wonderful mind pictures was so exciting. And I realized that you can do that. If you write stories, they can take you somewhere else. This is an unusual party for me. This man Gatsby sent over a chauffeur with an invitation, but I haven't seen him. I'm Gatsby. You are. The book was written in 1925, and it was the time of bootlegging and gangsters and the stock market crash. Wall Street losing no one every share. You don't actually know what he's involved in. You know he has a lot of money and a wonderful mansion. And he falls in love with this gorgeous girl, Daisy Buchanan, who he thinks is going to give him everything. It's about a mysterious man and a great love. 
But the youngest literary wunderkind in your top 100 managed to work out the meaning of life, the universe, and everything at the tender age of 27. Douglas Adams for The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm really, really pleased that Hitchhikers is in there. It's basically a funny book, but yes, there's philosophy and there's science. It talked about things that mattered and came up with ridiculous answers. If this was a comedy book that was trivial, I don't think people would vote for it. I think it's because it, in its own oblique way, talked about the meaning of life, which of course we remember is 42. That's genius, you see. And if you're wondering who's the oldest author in the top 100, it's Roald Dahl, who wrote Matilda at the ripe old age of 72. It's often the books we read when we're young that stay with us and become our lifelong favorites. So how many of your top 100 are written for children? The ones you love when you're a child, you love with an unconditional and undying love. Biggles. Biggles could well be on the list. I've seen loads of people reading Harry Potter books that are kind of 40. I wouldn't be surprised if it was 40%. The answer is 30. Nearly a third of your top 100 were originally written for children, from Victorian classics to modern teenage dramas. Amongst the classics you chose are Alice in Wonderland, Anne of Green Gables, The Secret Garden, Treasure Island, Wind in the Willows, Winnie the Pooh, and Enid Blyton's The Magic Faraway Tree, as well as this story about good, evil, and a very precious ring. I read Talking to the Hobbit when it was first published and um, loved it. The Hobbit, I think, is just right. It's a jolly good story, goes on just long enough, very exciting. Another of your choices is C.S. Lewis's enchanting story of Aslan and the amazing world of Narnia. It's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. It was one of my favourite books when growing up and um, it's just the most incredible story. The fact that this big old wardrobe could actually hold the promise and the wonder of the most extraordinary adventure that is going to change these children's lives and ours. And um, furniture's just never been the same for me since then. <laughs> <laughs> but not every children's book you voted for is about magic. Some deal with real issues, like this early example of Girl Power by Louisa May Alcott. I'm really pleased to see Little Women there because some people might think it was too sentimental. Me, Joe, having her hair cut off in order to save the family who was short of money. I mean, every child who's read that book will remember that heroic gesture, because it was so wonderful. She came back with her boy's hair, I and mean, it's, it's such a brilliant book. My mother read it when I was a child, but I mean, I read it again and again and again. It's the most lovely book. You also voted for this most British of stories about summer holidays and messing about in boats, Swallows and Amazons by Arthur Ransom. I'm really delighted that Swallows and Amazons is up there. It, it was my favorite book when I was eight, nine, 10. And it starts with the youngest of one of the families, Roger, who's going up the field to meet his mum and he's tacking because he's going against the wind, right? So he has to go left and right and left and right. And eventually when he gets there, he realizes that she's holding in her hand a telegram from daddy. And this is critical because they've all written to him to ask whether they can go camping on their own. And they camp on an island in the middle of a lake. I read Swallows and Amazons again about a month ago, and it's, it's still the most wonderful story. But it's not just children's classics of yesteryear that have made it into your top 100. Today's younger generation have also voted for your favorite contemporary children's books. These include Lewis Sacker's tale of a boy's detention in a Texan boot camp, Holes. Meg Cabot's The Princess Diaries, 
Artemis Fowl, the 12-year-old criminal mastermind by Oim Colfer. And this powerful novel about racism by Mallory Blackman. Noughts and Crosses is a very serious work about racial tension and um, it makes you rethink things. I think it's, it's a wonderful book. When it comes to books dealing with big themes, there are none bigger than Philip Pullman's fantastical trilogy, His Dark Materials. He can conceive of other worlds, several of them take you into huge adventures in lands of ice. He has the most extraordinary imagination. These are just grand books, you know, they tell a fantastic story about the struggle between good and evil, I and mean, it's epic. I think his Dark Materials has a chance of becoming one of the great legendary stories. I mean, you know, Homer, Virgil, Philip Pullman, let's go for it. Thank you for the day. One of your favorite children's books is this heartrending story by Michelle Magorian. Good Night, Mr. Tom is a lovely book because it's about a child being uh, sent from the East End of London during the war to live in the country. Uh, and he comes from a very impoverished, rather cruel background. There's a very grumpy man who doesn't really want to have this child. So I'm sorry, Mr. Oakley, but he just has to go somewhere. But uh, he puts up with it. And gradually, this very loving relationship builds up between this lost little boy and Mr. Tom. I can ride, Dad! I can really ride! And it's just a lovely story, touching story. I would defy anybody not to cry at the end. We've now told you about 57 of the books in your top 100. Still to come, which of these books by women writers made it into your top 100? We'll give you a clue. It was only one. But first... The Hooked On Books reading group, led by Edwina Curry, doesn't believe age should be an obstacle when it comes to discussing their favorite novels. I was invited to come and talk to a group of residents here about my books, and they took me off to tea afterwards. And I said, well, have you got a book club? Oh, that is a brilliant idea. You will run it. And that's what we've been doing ever since, about five years now. It's very pleasant to meet. We meet about once a month or so. How are you getting on with it? I know you haven't all finished it. I put it down after one reading, and I haven't bothered. <laughs> <laughs> we pull our views, you know, and everybody's got something usually something different to say. I've read more books in a year here than I think for years. It's keeping my brain alive. It's no good just sitting like that. It's a lot of people just sit like that. But then you, if you're excited with the book, you sort of, it wakes you up. If you want to find out how to join a reading group or set one up, call The Big Read on free phone 08000 150 950 or visit our website at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash big read. Don't forget, register your reading group with us. You could win a great prize. Our love affair with America goes on through music, films and fashion. But what about fiction? How many of the books in your top 100 are by American authors? If there was any justice, there would be a lot of American authors. Unless we've got the Grishams and the, uh, and the Stephen Kings, uh, 8%. I would hope um, quite a small percentage. Judging by my own reading, very subjective as that is, I think there's probably quite a substantial number of Americans on the list. The answer is exactly a fifth, with 20 entries from the States, including J.D. Salinger's classic tale of adolescence, The Catcher in the Rye, The Godfather, by Mario Puzzo, Frank Herbert's sci-fi adventure, Dune, A Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving, and Jean M. Owls, The Clan of the Cave Bear. But John Steinbeck is the only American to have two entries, of Mice and Men and The Grapes of Wrath, both gritty stories set in the depression of the 1930s. I can't come back to the homestead, the shack no longer stands. The Grapes of Wrath is a story about the American Depression. It's about farmers and farm workers who have been moved off their land and head west, the great American dream. 
We're going to California, ain't we? All right, then, let's go to California. Well, that don't sound like your mom. You never was like that before. I never had my house pushed over before. It's full of anger and rage about the plight of the poor and these farmers that have got families and they're out on the road and they're moving west and they're looking for a better life and everything is against them. The American dream is turning into a nightmare. Where do you think you're going? A fellow named Spencer sent us. Said there was work picking peaches. Oh, you want to work, huh? Sure do. And it's as relevant today as it was then. It's a book that's all about injustice. Another American novel which has become a cult hit over here is On the Road by Jack Kerouac, a Bible for the Beat Generation, and still a book many of you worship today. I loved it when I first read it. I can remember lying underneath a tree on holiday when I was 14, 15 years old, and reading On the Road, and then um, annoying my parents by uh, talking in uh, sort of hip cat slang for the next sort of two weeks. told me about a way of life and an approach to life which, uh, frankly, being a kid brought up in a comprehensive school in Middlesbrough, I had never even imagined existed. Uh, and I thought it was all rather terrific. So it's sort of one hands down on every possible count. It was romantic, it was sexy. It seemed to embody a degree of free-spiritedness which I hadn't come across before. In the last 30 years, the British have begun to enjoy foreign food but do we have an appetite for foreign fiction? So how many books in the top 100 were originally written in a foreign language? Oh, we don't like foreign books. I shouldn't imagine any of the French bunch would get in there. But I'd be surprised if there weren't more than a dozen. I bet there's no Germans. Maybe some Greeks in there, maybe some South Americans, you never know. Not many would be the answer to that. The answer is eight of the books in your top 100 were originally written in a foreign language. These include, from Brazil, The Alchemist by the country's most popular author, Paulo Coelho. From Germany, you voted for Patrick Suskin's chilling tale of a mass murderer in 18th century Paris who kills for smell. It's perfume. From Colombia, Nobel Prize winner Gabriel Garcia Marquez has two entries, 100 Years of Solitude and Love in the Time of Cholera. My favourite of those books is Love in the Time of Cholera, which I think is an absolutely beautiful book. And uh, I like it very much at my age because it's all about old age sex, you know. <laughs> they go, ends them going up and down the river, pretending that the ship has got cholera, having it off for all eternity. And that appeals to me. It's great to see uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez on there for 100 Years of Solitude. I remember reading that book in the 80s and suddenly there were, you know, talking chickens and sort of, you know, clouds rolling past at speed and there was magical realism. I love the politics of it, the idea of revolution, the idea of history in the book, the idea of one man's destiny. Um, just absolutely fantastic. From Russia. But Russia took your vote for the most books in translation, with three in your top 100. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, and two novels by Leo Tolstoy, War and Peace, and the tragic love story, Anna Karenina. It's about the kind of struggle to get away from the consuming obsession of a devouring love and the failure to do so. There are moments in Anna Karenina which actually don't, you know, which are just mind-blowingly extraordinary, like when Anna's in the railway train and Vronsky is sort of following her. So she gets out of it in some miserable place in between Moscow and Petersburg, and there he is. You've got to forget about me. I can't. Vronsky is just a sort of big fat zero, and you think, oh, she's so gorgeous. Why does, you know, why does she ruin her life for him? At which point, the big hairy face of Tolstoy would say, duh, that's the point, that's the point. When women first started writing novels, they either had to be anonymous or pretend to be a man to get published. Times have changed. But how much? What percent of the books are by women? Given um, the society we live in, my guess would be 40%. How great if it was 50-50? Certainly it won't be half. 
I suppose that'd be about 10%. It's not enough, or not nearly enough. 22, of whom two will really be worthy of it. Sorry, Brown. 31% of your top 100 list were women. Amongst the books you voted for were Dodie Smith's I Capture the Castle, Anya Seton's Catherine, The Shell Seekers by Rosamond Pilcher, as well as this timeless love story by Charlotte Bronte. I immediately identified with Jane. Jane was quite an introverted girl who was quite plain. She loved reading and she had a tough time as a child. And we, the readers, identified with her struggles. No, 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 come here, come here, come here. It was the first book I read all the way through. I started to read it when I went to bed on a cold winter's night. It started to snow and I read it all the way through in the morning. I heard the birds singing. There was deep snow outside and I read it on the way to school and finished reading it in the cloakroom surrounded by wet gabardine, Macintoshes and Wellingtons. Um, and I really simply could not put it down. Jane, uh... I'm coming back to you. You also chose this book by George Eliot, whose real name was Marianne Evans. I had five months alone in the sub-Antarctic, and I took Middlemarch by George Eliot with me, and it absolutely blew me away. It is undoubtedly the best novel in the English language. Middlemarch is a human saga. It's a saga of families and lovers, friends, enemies, inheritance. It's based in an imaginary provincial town in the early part of the 19th century. And it's really about the middle classes more than anybody else. It's quite a bit about greed, quite a bit about knowledge, quite a bit about love, quite a bit about individualism, and quite a bit about the human spirit. I had planned myself to try writing a novel. After I'd finished Middlemarch, I put the book down and I thought it isn't even worth trying. After George Eliot, after Middlemarch, what is the point of trying to write an English novel? There's a ghost in my house. You also voted for this great novel by Daphne du Maurier, with one of the most famous opening lines ever written. Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. I'm thrilled that Rebecca's there. I don't know how many men admit to reading romantic fiction, but I do. I mean, all the time. And Rebecca I read when I was 14 in a hut at the side of the bowling green in Ilkley when I was working overtime collecting shillings in the evenings for people who wanted to play tennis and bowls, and it rained for a week. And for three hours every night I read Rebecca. I could smell the rhododendrons on that drive coming off the page. And not realising, I don't think, until the end of the book that I didn't know her name, only that Rebecca was his first wife. But still now I can feel the shiver going down the spine from that book. And Mrs Danvers... She's the real Mrs. De Winter, not you. It's you that's the shadow and the ghost. It's you who ought to be dead, not Mrs. De Winter. Look, Dorothy, why don't you jump? It's a quick, kind way, not like drowning. Why don't you jump? You've now heard about 77 of the books. Still to come, which of these bestsellers made blockbuster movies? And which of them bombed? But first... I'm Tim. And I'm Chris. And we run a book review website for 10 to 15 year olds called Cool, cool Reads. People who like to like go on it, they might have a book they've just read and want to talk about it, so they just fill out the form. We wanted to give an honest opinion of books because often we go out and buy books after reading reviews by adults and the adults thought that this book was good for children and we didn't necessarily agree so we wanted to show that in the reviews. This one's good. 
We get about 2,000 people who come to the site every week. We get people from all over the world, really. We get most of our reviews from Europe and America, but um, we do get quite a few reviews from New Zealand and Australia as well. We didn't actually expect to get such a good response, and we were really pleased about that. Um, we were hoping that just some people would go to it and it might grow a bit, but it has actually really surprised us. If you want to find out how to join a reading group or set one up, call The Big Read on free phone 08000 150 or visit our website at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash big read. All the top 100 books could be yours if you register your reading group with us. The first bestseller list appeared in the Sunday Times back in 1974 and since then, 1.6 million titles have been published. How many of them made it into your top 100? Probably too many. Books published in the last 30 years, I think, will constitute 95% of the list. You know, current popularity always works in these polls, so I think 80% 80 maybe, 80 maybe higher. I would think a good 25%. The answer is 41% of your top 100 were published in the last 30 years. Amazingly, some of the biggest selling books of recent years haven't made it into the list. Fever Pitch, High Fidelity, and About a Boy, all smash hits for Nick Hornby, don't appear. Neither does Alex Garland's The Beach, even though it sold over five million copies. But some that have been included are Geoffrey Archer's Cain and Abel, Memoirs of a Geisha by Arthur Golden, The Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, Magician by Raymond E. Feist, and The Thornbirds by Australian writer Colleen McCulloch. I think it's the best bad book I've ever read, because it is truly bad, but it's fantastic. You also voted for this wartime romance, which has sold more than one and a half million copies since it was published in 1993, Sebastian Folk's Birdsong. It begins with a very romantic, rather sexy story of a young man in a bourgeois French household who falls in love with the madame. Then it sort of moves into the trenches in the First World War and becomes grindingly grim. But because you've been with this young man through his love affair, you stay with him through this dreadful experience in the trenches. And that contrast is something that stays with people for a long time. I read it because people were talking about it, actually, and saying how great it was. And whenever I hear that about a book, uh, I know it's worth me reading it. Since its publication in 1996, Helen Fielding's Bridget Jones's Diary has sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. I think Bridget Jones was so successful because it's very accessible and it's funny and we can identify with her. And she's got all the modern angst, you know, about calories and cigarettes and drink. Look, she nicked the plot from the best. You know, Pride and Prejudice always was a good plot, so Bridget Jones uses it very sensibly, translates it very cleverly. This wonderful, charming, funny scoundrel comes into her life, and she falls for him. But he's Wickham in Pride and Prejudice. And Darcy is around, uh, but she takes some time to notice him. Had Bridget Jones read Pride and Prejudice, she would have noticed a little earlier that she was back in the wrong horse. Many of us discover great books by watching adaptations on the screen. So how many of the top 100 have been made into films or TV dramas? I'd be very surprised if a good half of the books on this list haven't in some sense or another appeared on the screen. I think there's probably about 30 or 40% at least 
I wouldn't be surprised if it was all 100, but let's say more than 90. Not very many. 25, maybe? I should think most of the books on the list have been made into films and TV dramas. Um, 70%. Close, Ian. 71% of your top 100 books have been made into film or television dramas. Often when people think of a book, they actually, they're thinking of the film. The great achievement is film and, of film and television is to spread the word. And I know that they do put up the sales of the paperbacks of the books involved. Among those 71 adapted for the screen are Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd and Tess of the D'Urbervilles, Animal Farm and 1984 by George Orwell. Also, William Golding's Lord of the Flies and Neville Shute's A Town Like Alice. But sometimes bestsellers don't guarantee blockbusters. We asked Barry Norman which of your choices were damp squibs when they were transferred to the screen. Why does it always rain on me? Captain Corelli's Mandolin, a love story set on the island of Kefalonia during the Second World War. I liked it very much, but I had not read Louis de Bernier's book. And all the people I met who have read the book hate the film. They kept coming up to me after my review and saying, how, how could you like it? Nicholas Cage as Captain Corelli. Signorina! Signorina! You are drunk. Captain Antonio Corelli, 33rd Regiment Artillery, reporting for duty! Joseph Heller's anti-war classic Catch-22 also got your vote, but the movie version of it doesn't get Barry's. What they got wrong there was the casting. Alan Arkin actually is a very fine actor who played Yasserian, but Yasserian was a young man. Alan Arkin was 36, and as soon as you've got a man of 36 playing Yasserian, you've lost a hell of a lot of, of what the, the whole story is, is, is all about. Those bastards are trying to kill me! <laughs> no one's trying to kill you, sweetheart. Now, you deserve like a good boy. Oh, yeah? Then why are they shooting at me, Milo? They're shooting at everyone, Yasserian. Hello, Leopold. But for Barry, the book which, though loved by you, truly bombed at the box office was James Joyce's epic Ulysses, a day in the life of a Dubliner. God knows it's hard enough book to read, you know, I mean, and then to put it on a film is, is an impossible task, which Joseph Strick, I think, he tried manfully, but it really didn't work. Trinity medical students, all pricking no pens. Thankfully, some books also shine on the screen. Barry's favourite film or TV adaptations are Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell's American Civil War epic. It is brilliantly done. This idea, you know, of just setting four personal stories against that enormous uh, background of the American Civil War, and they caught that superbly well. I've loved you more than I've ever loved any woman. And I've waited longer for you than I've ever waited for any woman. Barry also applauded Brideshead Revisited, Evelyn Waugh's tale of an aristocratic world in decline. It's probably the best TV adaptation of any book done so far. Everything was right about it, and it just worked all the way through. You know, I mean, people were riveted by it from beginning to end. We ate the strawberries and drank the wine. As Sebastian promised, they were delicious together. And Barry's number one is David Lean's film of Charles Dickens' classic novel, Great Expectations. He took this novel of nearly 500 pages and made a film of less than two hours, and he lost nothing. The whole spirit of the book and the characters and the dialogue, um, it's all there. And that it was a really brilliant piece of work to take such a big book and make such a wonderful film. That there hunted dog which you kept life in got his head so high that he made a gentleman. And Pip, you're him. Why, I'm your second father, Pip, and you're my son. We've now told you about 95 of your top 100. And the final five books which have also been adapted for the screen are Watership Down by Richard Adams, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, John Fowles, The Magus, Mervyn Peake's Gormenghast, and The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. So those were the books you chose as your top 100 reads. In case you missed any of them, here they all are again in alphabetical order. Remember, if you want to find out how to join a reading group or set one up, call the Big Read Information Line, free phone 08000 150 950, or visit our website at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash Big Read. If you register your reading group with us, 
you could win some great prizes, including all the top 100 books. We'll be back in November, when we'll be revealing your top 20 big reads and asking you to vote for your favourite book of all. You've just had the results of the biggest ever literary poll in the UK. In a few minutes, I'm going to be joined by some of the leading lights of the literary world to discuss what, if anything, this tells us about our nation's reading habits. Join me at five past ten for the big read debate on BBC Four. Oh,